John Guest wrote a book called uh, Finding Deeper Intimacy with God, Only a Prayer Away. And in the book itself, he writes about an, uh, an illustration of discipline versus spontaneity. And really, you could kind of say that in his illustration, spontaneity is kind of a code word for ADD. And he talks about this idea of people who are disciplined versus those that just want to live life by spontaneity and running around by the seat of their pants and how he deals with those two together. And he says, discipline today is a dirty word in our culture. And he goes, I know I'm speaking heresy in many circles, but spontaneity is greatly overvalued. And he goes on to say, the, sponta uh, the, the spontaneous person who shrugs off the need for discipline is like, and he uses an illustration, of a farmer who is going out to gather eggs. And the farmer goes out to gather his eggs, and as he walked across the farmyard toward the hen house, he noticed that the pump was leaking. So he stopped to fix it. It needed a new washer. So he set off to the barn to get one. And on his way to the barn, he saw that the hayloft needed straightening. So he went off to fetch a pitchfork. But he, uh, and when he got to the pitchfork, he found a broom hanging there with a broken handle. And he says, I must make a note to myself to buy a new broom the next time I'm in town, he thought. And the next thing, and the next thing. And by now it's clear that the farmer is not going to get to his eggs. It's likely that he's not going to get anything accomplished he set out to do for the day. He is utterly and gloriously spontaneous, but he is not free. He, if it's anything, is a prisoner of his unbridled spontaneity. The fact of the matter is that discipline is the only way to freedom. It is the necessary context for spontaneity. And this morning, we're going to look at the difference between these two and what James has for us in these three areas that he asks us to be disciplined in in our own lives. Because really, when it comes down to it, there are things that you and I need to work out in our life, and these three really need to be embraced. That of being patient, that of being strengthened for the journey ahead, and the lack of complaining about other people. And so this morning, we're going to start this journey in these three areas. And then we're going to finish up with illustrations from the illustrations that he used in the text this morning. And along the way, hopefully, you might find yourself somewhere in here and catch some applicable points that you need to apply to your life as we move forward. The first area that James wants us to really deal with is the idea to be patient. Now, notice the words in verse 7. Therefore, what he's dealing with is all the six verses above that in James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, that dealt with the wealthy and they're taking advantage of other people. And he's probably got a mindset that some of these people were the ones that the wealthy were taking advantage of says, yes, I understand the wealthier like this. Yes, they have done this. Therefore, church, be patient. Now, I don't know if you're like, uh, like other people who need to have some patience or have asked for patience. The key here is if you need patience, don't pray about it. You know why? Because God's going to bring it. And you come to God and say, hey, God, I, Lord, I just need some patience, and I pray that you would give me patience. And I could just see God up there in heaven chuckling. <laughs> All right. Hey, Jesus, watch this. Boom! <laughs> He's going to put you in a situation that you are going to need patience. And it isn't going to be that he is going to bring it to you. He's going to mold it into you. So be careful what you pray for. Matter of fact, patience is actually a gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is going to cultivate that in your life as you grow and you depend upon Him. 
And I'll speak to that more in a moment here. But as we begin to deal with this idea of patience, I want you to notice here, and in the text or in your notes, I want you to word, circle the word, be patient, those two words, and I want you to write above it, this is a command. This is a command. This isn't an option A or B. This isn't something that you get to do or not get to do. The Word of God tells you and commands you, be patient, brethren. And he's addressing the church. Now, you may ask yourself, well, I don't know how to be patient, or I, I need some patience and I keep praying for it, and all I do is get in trouble, or I have all this pressure come my way. What are the keys to understanding patience or how to be patient? That is the question we need to ask, and I want to answer with two things. Number one, the first key to being patient is trust in the sovereignty of of God. Now, what does that mean? What is the sovereignty of God? What that means is, is that God is in control and you are not. God is in control. He governs everything. Matter of fact, the pressure that you're under, the situations you find yourself in, they are there because of God's permissive will. He has allowed that into your life. So trust in the sovereignty of God that he's in control and you're not. Thank God we're not in control. The world would have been done, spun off its axes and bumped into Mars if we were in control. But God is in control. That's the first key. The second key is that we need to understand that God has a plan. It may seem that life is chaotic. It may seem that it is spinning out of control, but I want you to understand this. God has a plan. Now, the key to this thing is asking and finding out what is God's plan for you personally, for us corporately, and for our nation and the world. And a lot of that, God has already shown us in His Word what His plan is. His plan for your marriage, His plan for your parenting, His plan for your business, whatever it is, God has a plan. So trust it. Rest in that fact that God is in control and has a plan here. Now, both the Old and the New Testament speak a lot about patience. And how are we to deal with patience? In Psalm 37, verse 7, the psalmist says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Did you catch what comes before patience? What? Rest. Rest. Folks, we're running around like a bunch of chickens with our heads cut off, and it's just like chaotic, and we're trying to keep things in control. It's like the, the juggler at the circus. You're juggling 50 things, and you're trying to keep it all in the air, and we need to just stop for a moment and listen to the psalm and be still and know that I'm God. See, before patience comes, we rest. We rest and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. I know that we have walked through life and we've looked at other people's lives and we've seen how prosperous they are. And we see how it's almost like everything falls into place for that person. And oh, I wish I could be like them. Or oh, I wish have their status. Oh, I wish I could go on vacations like them. Oh, I wish I had this or that. Or, and you start comparing yourselves with others. And God just simply says, rest in me. That may not be my plan for you, but rest in me. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't work hard and go out and do what we're supposed to do and ask God's grace and favor and blessing upon what we put our hands to. But don't compare yourself to that level to say that, hey, I need to be there. Maybe that's not where God has you. And maybe He needs you to 
focus on another place, but rest in the Lord. The psalmist goes on further to say in Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon the rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Notice the psalmist starts and says, I, I waited patiently for the Lord. Folks, your prayers do not go unheard. Just because you don't hear anything back doesn't mean that God did not hear. Sometimes, beloved, he says yes, he says no, and then sometimes he says what? Wait. And when he says wait, guess where you're at? You're in that waiting period of patience. And sometimes we get impatient. And we jump ahead, and we try to control things, and we get out from God, and then we say, God, get over here and mess my, or bless my mess. That's sometimes it's God just kind of fix it. And he said, if you wouldn't have run ahead of me, you wouldn't have had this problem. Wait on me. Rest in me. The writer Isaiah, verse four, uh, chapter 40, verse 31 says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. You may be feeling weak right now in your journey. I'm going to ask you a question. How are you waiting on the Lord? Because sometimes when our journey, we're running out ahead of God, and we're running, and we're running. Man, we're exhausted, and we're thinking, where's God in all of this? And He's way down there behind you on the trail. He's still got His eye on you. But you're so far ahead of him, your strength isn't there. And Isaiah says, wait for the Lord and you'll gain new strength. Be like the child who walks by their parent and holds their hand. And then when some, something is, comes upon the trail that's fearful, we turn and we hold up our hands and say, Father, hold me. Let me rest in your arms. It's a beautiful picture of our Heavenly Father and us as children. Isaiah goes on to say, Those who wait on the Lord will mount up with wings like eagles. And we've got some eagles around here, but they're, man, they've got prolific eagles in Alaska. And man, those things can sail high. Man, they loft up there. I mean, you could just see them way up there. You know, you look at the clouds and those thunderheads that are rolling and, and boiling up to the point where they're just like way up there. Eagles fly at that level above the chaos and above all the stuff that gets us down up here. They fly at that level and God is saying, be patient and fly at that level. Let me take you to new heights. But you can't get there on your own. You've got to wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not become weary. Man, we so much drain our spiritual life because we don't wait on the Lord. And he says, wait, be patient. Trust me. Slow down. Trust me. The New Testament, Paul writes to the Galatian and the Colossian church, and then he writes to his young protege, Timothy. Encouraging words of patience, and he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, what? Patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. This is something that the Spirit produces in you. You don't, you don't produce the patience. God does. The way you help in the process is surrender and allow the Spirit to do His work in you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul goes on to say, Those who have been chosen of God, the elect, holy and blameless and beloved, put on. This is like putting on a shirt or a garment. You got dressed this morning to come to, sh 
come to church and you put on your clothes. You put your arm in the sleeve, wrapped it around, put it in the sleeve, buttoned up your shirt or pulled it over your head, whatever. You put something on to be here. Otherwise, we'd be all naked. We put something on. And same thing spiritually, we are to put on several things. A heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and what? Patience. You put this on. Work with God, but you put the patience on. You've got to be a part of the process as well. And Paul tells Timothy, the Lord's bondservant, and he's speaking to him as a young pastor, pastoring this church that has some trouble, and he says, the bondservant, Timothy, you're a bondservant. You must not be quarrelsome, but you need to be kind to all. You need to be able to teach, Timothy, And you need to be patient when people wrong you, Timothy. Church, I want you to put your name there. The Lord's bondservant, you, you put your name there. You, David, must not be quarrelsome. David must be kind to all. David must be able to teach and David must be patient when wronged, when your name is maligned, when your leadership is undermined, when no one thinks well of you or they speak bad of you in front of you and behind your back, be patient when wronged. And we're going to get it, folks. Just stay in the faith long enough and you'll get it. Somebody is going to bring something against you, whatever it is. And I can't tell you what it is, but it's coming. You may have already had a storm and it's passed, but guess what? Another one's coming. Be patient. Be patient. That's the first thing. That's the first discipline James wants us to attach ourselves to or cultivate in our life. Be patient. The second area that he desires for us to be disciplined is is in the strengthening of our own hearts. Strengthen your hearts for the journey ahead because it is a journey. Look at verse 8. You too be patient. Now in that text above in verse 7, he used the farmer as an illustration. And I'm going to use this on the back end to make my point. But he made the point that the farmer is patient when he plants his crops And then the rain comes and the sun and God's plan for this crops and all that. And he can't do anything other than what he has done is plant the crop. He can't go out there and crawl around in the dirt and speak to the little plant. Say, come on, little plant, get up. Can't do that. It didn't work. He just got to be patient until it pops up and here we go. And so he starts in verse 8. You too, like the farmer, be patient, church. And then he says, here's the second thing, strengthen your hearts. And oh, by the way, circle strengthen your hearts and write the word command because this is a command, this isn't an option. You are commanded to strengthen your hearts. Why? What motivates us to do this? For the Lord of the coming of the Lord is near. Now, let's talk about this strengthening, a command. Starizo in the Greek. It means to make fast, to establish, or to confirm. It means to stand there resolute with whatever's coming my way. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to take it. I'm strengthening myself for whatever comes my way. Now, there are two people in life. When something comes your way, there are those that run away from it and there are those that run to it. Which person are you? Those that run away or those that run to it. Whenever I'm out on my cycle, my bike, and I'm cycling, I've always got to watch for four legged critters. It has, sometimes has a bushy tail and it barks. And sometimes those dogs come out from somebody's yard or whatever, especially when I'm out in the country riding. Those farm dogs, I don't know what they're protecting, but. Pfft, 
riding along, you know, and here comes the dog, you know, and you can do one of two things. I don't know what's coming behind me, so if I swerve away from the dog, I might swerve right into some car that's coming this way. So you know what I do? I, I take it to the dog. Seriously, I'm paddling, the dog, I'm like, dude, you are not, you are not biting me today. And man, I head right for that dog, and I start growling at the dog, and they don't know what's going on. They go scurrying off, and I just keep on riding. So you can face your fears. You can either run from it, and if I would have run from the dog, guess what he's going to do? He's going to chase me down and bite my ankle. But if I take it to him, no way, not today, not on my watch. Not on my watch. So I take it to the dogs of life. And so when you're out in your journey, you remember this. Find strength and resolution in your heart to take it to the barking dogs of your life. Run to that danger and face it square on. Don't run from it. See, as the persecution of the early church was ramping up, James charges his readers to prop themselves up, steal themselves for what's coming. Why would he do that? Because he says the Lord is coming back and don't let him see you running away. Stand firm in that face. Can you imagine if Jesus ran away from the cross? We would all be headed to hell right now. There would be no salvation. He would have disqualified himself and there would be no salvation. He faced it straight on. And I want you to notice that this falls fully on you to strengthen your heart. This isn't something that God does. The verb here is active. We're doing this, strengthening our hearts. This is what you and I need to do. This is not God's responsibility. Will he help you along the way? Absolutely. But you have got to determine that you're going to strengthen your heart and move forward in the journey. Now, we have an adage in our culture that sounds like this. Let go and let God. You all heard this one, right? Okay, let go and let God. What do we mean by this? What does that mean? Does anybody know what that means? Let go of what? You know, it's like the Beetle Bailey where the guy was running. He flew over the cliff and he lands and he catches the, uh, the branch, and he's hanging there over this precipice, and he goes, God, please help me. And the voice comes and says, let go. And he goes, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> let go of what? See, I think this is appropriate at times. Because you can say... Let go of our pride and let God have it. Let go of our self-control and let God have it. Those are appropriate times, but not here. Not here. Because this, we are to strengthen our own hearts. And I think a better adage than let go and let God here would be this one. Own it. You own this one. This is your responsibility. This is where you and I, we get in the ball game and we help God. This is where the process works, where he and and I work in tandem with this process. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Paul's writing to the church, and he says this, So then, my beloved brethren, just as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but also in my absence, Paul is away, he's writing the letter back, and he says this to them, Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Stop right there for a minute. That does not say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation, meaning it's a possession that you already have, and he's wanting you to work it out, make it look good as as you journey forward. You already possess it, now work it out. But it isn't just your responsibility here. There is a balance. Look at verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know what his good pleasure is? He wants to build in you the image of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants you to look like in the end. So this is a a tandem work that we help and God helps. And 
it reminds me again of a cycling illustration. Since I love to cycle, it's like the pedals on a bike. I don't know, you know, it, you, one works and then the other, and as you, and you, long as you're pushing both of them, you're going to move forward. Whether you're on, well, you won't move forward if you're on a treadmill or one of those bike trainers, but if you're out on the street, you're going to move forward. That's just what a bike does. You start and you go forward. I don't know if you've ever tried to ride a bicycle tr with only one pedal. You know, either the pedal fell off or it came unscrewed or you're just kind of messing around and you're trying to pedal. So you push down and you got to pull your foot off, put it underneath it and pull it up. And you look like a goober, you know, you're like, you know, trying to, it's like, what is that? Now, we who like to cycle, we've got all the gear and we clip into our pedals. And I can ride my bike with one pedal because I can put my foot out here and I can just pedal all I want because my, my shoe is attached to my pedal. And so I can push down and pull up so I don't have that problem. I can pedal with one pedal. Like a dog attacks me on my leg here and it's kind of like, yeah, I can pedal with one leg to get home, you know, <laughs> gimp home. But both those pedals have to work if you really want to make this thing work. And your salvation and your journey is exactly like that. God asks you to work out your salvation, and he's working in you, and they're both working together smoothly to move forward with one another. So the next time you're on your bicycle, yes, some of you are going to go home and dust that bike off that's been hanging in the garage, air up the tires, ch -ch -ch. try the illustration. I'm working out my salvation, and God is working in me, and here we go. And then come, let's go ride bikes together. It's good, good exercise. Exercise our spiritual journey as well as our physical journey. That's the second thing that, that uh, James wants us to understand is, is strengthening our hearts, which is your responsibility in the journey. Be patient, strengthen your heart, and the last thing that we are to really involve ourselves in is not complaining against each other. Don't complain. Now, I want you to circle those first three words. Do not complain. Circle that. And then I want you to, I want you to put right above that, stop. Put the word stop right above that. The reason I ask you to do that is because the do not complain is a negation of the verb of complaining. And the adverb, the negative adverb that's in front of it, asks the person to stop an action that's already going on. So what James is addressing here is an action that is constantly going on in the church, and he comes along and says, stop doing that. So really, the word would say, stop continually complaining against each other in the church. That's what's going on here. And he says, stop doing that. Because it's ungodly and it's not appropriate within the church. Stop doing that. He says, stop complaining, brother, against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged because the judge is standing right at the door, meaning that he's imminently coming. And let us not be found judging and complaining against one another when the Lord comes. Let us not be found running away when the Lord comes but strengthening our hearts and facing our fears. You see, really when it comes down to it, when we complain and complain and complain and complain, what we're doing is embracing a spirit of bitterness and resentfulness. And it has no place in the Christian church. It has no place in the believer's life. Because what it does, it, that bitter, resentful spirit begins to manifest itself in our relationships with other people. And not only does it defile me, because nobody wants to be around a person that complains all the time. They don't. And if you're that type person and you're complaining all the time, the people that are hanging around with you, they're just being nice to you. They don't really care to be hanging around people that complain all the time. Because what it does is then it, be, it produces a spirit of bitterness in a person's life and then it defiles that person and then it spills over and it begins to defile other people. And it is so insidious and sinful and ungodly in the church 
that, it, that God's going to judge it. Because he says, the judge is standing right at the door. He says, don't complain so that you won't be judged. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says this. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it may be defiled. I want you to notice something in this text. Um, Root of bitterness, that word root there means that something's already in place, has been placed there, and has been there long enough to put down roots. So that bitterness has been there for some time. It isn't that you just got there because it's been, it's been there, it's been cultivated, it's been ruminated over, it's continued to be rehashed in the mind, and it's set down roots And now it's going to spill over into other relationships that I have. Be careful about allowing bitterness to root down in your spiritual journey. Paul says to the Philippians, Do all things without grumbling or disputing or fighting or arguing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked in perverse generations. See, the world, that's what the world does. They fight and backbite and do all that stuff. And if it gets in the church, it fractures and tears the church apart. And you know what it also tears apart? Our witness. Our evangelism. Why in the world would I want to be part of that? Because I already got it out here. I don't need it over there. There's no reason to join that group. So be careful about the complaining And if it's already ongoing, James says, stop continually complaining against one another. And then to help kind of solidify this and drive it home, he uses three examples that we need to look at. Number one, he uses the farmer. Now, I don't know how many of you are farmers out there or have, uh, you know, maybe you're one of these really expert gardeners and you like to you know, garden an acre or so or whatever. You know, ours is you know, about the size of this screen right here. One plant, pff, there we go. That's easy to weed, that one. But if you garden or you farm or you plant something in the ground, you're at the mercy of the elements. You're at the mercy of your time frame to go out and water. Especially if you farm and you go out and you just kind of plant out there in those fields you, you, I mean, you're not going to go seed the rain clouds. I mean, you know, shoot up a rocket and, you know, help it along. You just, you just wait. And it might get there and it might not. And then, man, when it's almost ready to harvest time, there may be a thundercloud come along and poof, just drop hail on your crop. It's like, man, I'm glad I had insurance. And so you're at the mercy of the elements. And the farmer is patient. And he's... He's at the mercy of God's sovereignty when it comes to yielding that crop. And there are some things out of his control, folks. He can't control some of that stuff. But I want to point out to you something that so too, there are some things out of our control and that we find ourselves at the mercy of another person's decision or God's timing. Maybe you're feeling pressure today to give up on your faith. Circumstances seem like a riptide has pulled you out from the shore and has dropped you a hundred yards out from the beach, from the safety and from the shoreline. And you don't know how to get back. And you're out there floundering, wondering if I'm going to get back. What are you going to do? Well, my encouragement to you is to know God and to trust His plan. And if you've been pulled apart by the riptide currents and they've thrown you off to the side in a heap and you're wondering what's up and what's next, I encourage you to look toward your faith. And maybe you're here today and you don't have a faith. Maybe you're just kind of wondering if this Jesus thing is really, really real. And whether these people really know what they're doing. 
And if that's you, I would ask that you take a second look at Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross and the Father who crushed him so that we could have eternal life. And that same eternal life is offered to you today if you don't know him. And I would love to be able to speak to you about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ if that's you here today. It is simple surrenderance of trusting that he loves you, died for you, and all you got to do is surrender. But it's not going to happen until you do it. God's not going to drag you into the king, kingdom kicking and screaming. You've got to be able to make the decision. You work with him. Is he calling you? Is he standing on the shore as the riptides have taken you out? He's standing there and he's asking, come back. And how are you going to come back? He's going to send a patrol boat out to get you and bring you back. But you've got to be willing to get in the boat. Otherwise, the sharks of life are going to rip you to shreds. Take your chances. The farmer waits. The prophets wait. Notice in our text, it says, An example, brethren, the suffering, the patience. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Man, you go back and read the Old Testament, and those prophets, man, you talk about being kicked while you're down. Kicked in the shin, and when they bent over to say, ow, they kicked them right in the nose. They burned them. Threw them to wild animals. They were mistreated, bad Notice what the Hebrew writer says, and I want you to look at verse 37. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. There was a punishment for the prophets. They would take this log, which was hollow. They would stick a person inside the log, and the old sawn in two magic trick didn't work on this one. They would just stick the person in there and saw that log in two and saw the person in two, right? Both halves. prophets being cut in half. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, mountains, caves, holes in the ground. How about that? Where do you live? Oh, I live in number eight hole over there. I'm a hobbit. No, wait a minute, I'm a prophet. That's how they were treated. And we looked at them with the great patience they had of knowing that God had a plan and he was sovereign and that they were obeying what he said to tell Israel and Judah. And they kept on and they kept on and they kept on. Be patient. When God calls you, be patient. And the last person that James wants us to look at is the person of Job. You all remember Job, right? Not Job, Job. You know the story of Job, right? It's the book right before Psalms. And you start the opening chapter and, hey, you know, and all the sons of men were coming before the Lord. And the Lord said, hey, have you seen my, my servant Job? Yeah, I've seen your servant Job, but you protect him. Well, whatever he has is in your hands. And what happens? Man, Satan attacks him by the permissive will of God. And look at everything he loses. He lost his children. He lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his reputation, and folks, he lost his sense of God's presence in the moment because he thought he was done. He thought, what in the world has happened to me? And it's like the bomb has gone off and he's wandering around just shell-shocked going, I don't know what happened. I'm confused. I, I, don't, I don't know what happened. But yet, in the midst of all of that, there is great hope because listen to what Job said in Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Why does he hope in God? Because he knows his sovereignty and he knows that God has a plan. He doesn't know the end game, but he knows God has a plan. And if you read the end of Job, he blesses him so much he has more children, more wealth, more homes, more everything. God just brings it and dumps it on him, and he blesses him for his faithfulness. So in the midst of all these things that you're going through in life, no matter what it is, if it's small or large, 
trust God and his sovereignty and that he's got a plan for you and it'll work out in the end for you. It may not be what you think it is, but it's going to be at the very center of what God has for you. Be patient, strengthen your spiritual hearts for the journey, and stop complaining against each other. And you'll do well in this life as you move forward in your journey. Well, let me give you quickly four questions I want you to contemplate. When everything seems to be wrong, are you exercising patience in your life? Are you exercising patience? Or are you an impatient person? You want to control things and run ahead of God. Where are you at on that? Secondly, are you taking ownership for your own journey? Are you taking ownership for your own journey? Thirdly, are you struggling with bitterness in your heart due to a hurt? Are you struggling with bitterness? Confess to the Lord and don't let it take root. Don't let it take root. Deal with it and do it quickly. And then finally, where do you stand today with Jesus? Is he your Lord or is he just a name or a curse word? Where is Jesus for you today? Is he your Messiah, a Savior, Lord, Kurios, owner, boss of your life that you're listening to and hearing your spiritual journey and walking according to that? Or are you just seeing him as that name that's out there? I really don't have a personal relationship with him. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, none of this matters for you today. The only thing that you need to get straight is surrenderance spiritually to the king who was crushed for you. My king died for me, and he died for you. May it be that you surrender if you, had, if you don't know him, and don't let it be tomorrow or the next day because you're not guaranteed those days. 